Okay. Hi, everyone. Last talk. We finally made it. <laughs> so only us, and then uh, we go out and drink beer and enjoy the rest of the sun. <laughs> so welcome, everyone. Uh, nice that you're still here with us. Um, and we are now here to talk about running Kubernetes in the manufacturing line. What could possibly go wrong? Yeah, exactly. So what is this about? We luckily uh, won a project um, to implement a Kubernetes platform at a chemical producing company. So that was the challenge itself, because if you think about if you produce chemical goods, something went wrong, then potentially it is not so good for everyone. So um, yeah, but before we go in detail, a few things about us. So my name is Tobias. You can say Toby. Um, I'm working for Kubernetes since four years. Um, now as a principal architect, help to adapt the customer side uh, Kubernetes in a scalable way. And yeah, I'm Mario. I'm also working for Kubernetes. Uh, I'm a professional service a Kubernetes consultant. We basically help our customers to build up their uh, Kubernetes uh, solution inside of their data centers or in their infrastructure. And as you can see, we're both from Bavaria. That's why we were Lederhosen, of course. Um, and now, to go deeper into everything, we need to go back in history. So, yeah, sorry, it's Friday, and history lessons are always bad, and no one likes history lessons. But uh, when we go back into the end of the end, 18th century, um, we had the first uh, weaveries that started mass producing goods. This was called Industry 1.0 now. I mean, it's new, but uh, we go with it. And then we have an involvement in the industry line. So we had mass production uh, in this, at the start of the 20th century, and we had computer automation in the 70s. So there were the first manufacturing lines that used robots and auto, uh, kind of aut started automating things. And now we reach the point where we call it industry 4.0, and we are now at the point where we have interactive systems, we have microchips in all of the manufacturing lines uh, down to the, to the single device, and uh, everything in the yeah, manufacturing plant is also virtualized. So when we look at Industry 4.0, it's like every manufacturing plant that we have need to be self-sufficient, but also interconnected to different other plants because we, uh, the, the whole production line maybe spans over a lot of factory plants. And we are currently into the process that we have like data analytics in every single step and uh, also security and observability that, my, that our systems are still running. And uh, also we want to improve every single step of our manufacturing process. So the problem here is, we now need a lot of compute power, and we also need a lot, of, uh, a lot of servers, but we cannot put them in the cloud because the amount of data that we would move to the cloud and get back from the cloud is just too big. So uh, everything is placed next to the manufacturing line. Manufacturing line. So all of those uh, machines need to work, but there are some locations that are very, very small. So maybe you need to put something into the cloud, which brings us to the big topic, it's all everywhere, and we need to combine everything, and uh, we need to be flexible. And for this, we thought, why not run the workload in the tool that we use all in our days, and Kubernetes. Yeah, and then we said, okay, Kubernetes, cool. Chemical manufacturing, oh, scary. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's get this started. And we said, okay, come on, we are experiencing Kubernetes. What should go wrong? Um, and then we thought, okay, what's mainly the targets for all this project? So we thought, okay, let's start with some workshops. We discussed it, and then we came down to a few key project targets. So basically, is one is hosting manufacturing software. Why it's different? Manufacturing software is mostly not as like cloud native uh, software are. You are need to connect to ERP systems like SHP. You need to connect to machines. You need to connect to devices. We have a requirement that some Windows tablets are needing some of our services. And it's like printers. 
Do, do you ever get asked in a project about printers with Kubernetes? We are, and that was the thing. So, uh, and then we realized, okay, that's also a different kind of network. We are used to like IT network, but that's a manufacturing network. We have at least three firewall, as far as we know, um, across to reach this network. So we have a firewall from our managed service to the customer, from the customer to the cloud, from the cloud to the on-premise, from the on-premise to the user workload. So you see there are a lot of components what are really like interconnected and we need to first understand what is the topic of manufacturing. And that's what they want is a high stability and a high grade of automation. Why? If it could be that a data center or our data center on the manufacturing get destroyed by an accident or something and they need to be capable to reduce this, reduce, reduce, reproduce this quickly. And yeah then we need independency. So our operation of Kubernetes does not in, should not affect any other microservice deployment or the manufacturing software deployment. We need high availability, and that's across the distributed locations. So distributed location means we have currently running on three data centers, but the plan is to run it on 30 data centers. So, and then, um, yeah, we need E2E operations, so we need a team who can operate across the globe as data centers. So the next data center is US, so it will be completely different as we currently are working in Europe. Okay, then independency. What means in this in detail? So it means that we want to decouple things. So we're thinking in microservices, but it also means that an update of component A should not um, block a rollout of component B, and that goes back to the infrastructure. So if we're blocking people to deploy their changes, we are like kind of the bottleneck, and that is not possible in this case. Um, we want it to be fast, because fast means for them success. They want to migrate more or less everything in the end to the manufacturing line. They call it a digital backbone. For them, it's not Kubernetes. For them, it's a digital backbone for their future. So they want to be fast. Um, and important thing, my thing is abstract complexity. Everything is really complex. I think Kubernetes now is a point where we say, okay, phew, this is really, really complex. It's maybe too complex already. And that's something what you need to keep in mind that you make things simple, more consumable, and more replaceable that you say, okay, we still can handle it in a two pizza team. Okay. so. High availability, everyone has a different uh, interpretation of it. In our case, it was combined uh, HA across multiple data centers, so not only in one data center, it must be over all data centers, and multiple failure zones. So we have vSphere there, we have Azure, we have multiple really physical machines there where we need to cover, and we have a target SLA for 99.9.6. So this means monthly, monthly we have 70 minutes downtime. What is not much when an upgrade fails or something. So this is really a small number where we can fail. And that's something what you think in a year, it's only three hours. A year is really long. So three hours, if something fails, could be really a tough time frame to fix it. But currently, we are fine. We managed to do it. And we now go in detail how we did it. Yes, so we have another component that you usually not think of is we are in a corporate world. A corporate world has a lot of departments and they don't necessarily want to speak to each other and they are really, really big and you need to, to communicate with everyone. And uh, for this, we needed to basically go to our, to our customer and say, we cannot do everything by ourselves, so and we, uh, we, need, we need a counterpart. So for this, we have a stakeholder team at uh, our customer to, with whom we talk, with whom we, we design the whole architecture, and uh, with whom we yeah, talk on a daily basis and uh, create the complete architecture. But also, we need to talk to the consumer departments because they are creating the requirements for what they want to run on the cluster, what they need. Well, for example, we now need uh, 200 terabyte of data storage somewhere to be accessible in every data center. This is, this is a new requirement. So you, 
you're constantly talking to all of the teams. And also, we have the team that everyone likes and everyone loves, the security, who basically, they don't, maybe they know a little bit, but the first thing is they ask, are you, do you really want to do this? How you want to do this? No, you can't do this. And uh, it's a constant yeah, communication with them to bring them up to speed and also to teach them uh, so that you work together as a team. So we came up with the idea, why not splitting the competences into small departments so that everyone knows exactly this is my part, this is where I can focus on, and uh, this is where, where my core competencies are. So we started with one team, which is part of the, uh, part of the customer, which is the core infrastructure team. These teams are there for providing the basic level, like I need my data center, I need my network, I need my firewall appliances, I need my uh, Azure accounts. And um, so with these teams, we basically first designed the base layer of, of everything. And the next team, is the application platform team. So this is the team that with whom we work. So you can, you can say it, it's basically a vendor inside of the corporate. And, they, uh, and their customers are the different departments, and they ask you basically, hey, uh, we need a Kafka, but we don't need a Kafka for us alone. Can we just jump on a Kafka? So this team is providing very uh, uh, large services on a, uh, on, a, on a global level, and you can basically just go in and buy stuff from them. And the last team from the customer side is not one team, it's we don't know how many, because we never talk to them, but they are currently uh, always talking to, uh, to, the, uh, to the department uh, above them. These are the teams that are actually running their workload on those uh, Kubernetes clusters that we, that we provide together with the, uh, with the customer team. And they, there come all of the requests for, we need this, we need that, we need, we need, all of, uh, we need more storage, and we need to con uh, take all of this in account, and this is our job. We are basically the cloud native infrastructure team. So we provide large services, in all of the data centers, uh, we are doing the consumption reporting, we are doing the metering, and we are creating the, the clusters, and we are creating the, all of the infrastructure, and also we are taking care of the infrastructure. So we are the people where you can say, hey, everything is down, do something now. And then we come to the point where we say, running Kubernetes in the manufacturing line, how do we actually do this? I mean, it's not the simplest way. But we said, challenge accepted. What can go wrong? <laughs> now we are more on the technical side. So we solve kind of the setup. But then a core idea was, OK, to handle this, we need repeatable function units. And this m does not mean that it's technical a unit. It must be a component what we can use. This is not just Kubernetes. This is infrastructure. We have lots of things to care about, vSphere, permission models, and everything should be managed by API and GitOps. So we said, this is our approach to manage the scale, because we already know that we need to manage 30 data centers across the globe, globally, 24-7, with a high SLA. Um, and for that, the modularization was really the king. But how will our friend, the great firewall, work this? Because the firewall don't have an API we can implement against. Yes, do you ever talk to firewall teams in great com uh, corporates? It's really hard. It's hard, and we called it Wonderwall, because you never know if there's one firewall more. And that's what we did then. Uh, we built kind of object groups. We said, OK, we structurize it. We structurize the firewall rules in objects and said, OK, component A of data center need to talk with component B of data center. But the data centers are a generic object where we're putting different data centers into it and make it then with this rule set scalable. Maybe you think it's maybe a fancy program what I can download. No, it was Exosheet. OK, what else? Um, I think everybody heard it, infrastructure as code is great. Um, and automation, automation is our key 
success factor. And this starting with the setup of how our uh, team can set up, so we need to really clear um, how someone can bootstrap because it can be pos possible that we call, that we get a call, some of my colleagues, you are also sitting here, hi, um, get called in the night, need to check out the repository and somehow need to find something. And that's mostly the time what you lose. And you remember, if everything is down, we have 70 min minutes in the month. And that's why we said, okay, documentation must be also in the code repository that you have a single point to come into it. And we need a centralized scaling architecture. So we have one core concept or a few core concepts what we can then duplicate. Similar, we think data centers kind of are um, pods and we say, hey, we want to scale up the data centers. And also the users want to consume it like that. So the difference between um, a cluster provisioning between clouds are only a few, a few parameters. That brought us to the idea, okay, we standardize the data center. Standardized data center means for it, it must be independent and universal, but we have standard interfaces, how we connect it, how we manage services there, and we don't use any cloud specificas. And that's where basically we say, okay, data center, we need to quickly put everything in Kubernetes. That's our interface where we can implement it and make it for our end customers easy to consume. And the setup is really important that it's repeatable in short time because the disaster recovery case is one of the main factors of this company. So the company said to us, like if the production is down for a half hour, it's cost then already a million. And that's, can you uh, think about if something like hardware can fail, um, what this means? So we need to be really good at this. Yeah, and so we started, when we go back, like back in the time we had like Hmm. We, we introduced containers. Containers are now like cattle, so we don't care about them, we throw them away. Then we did the next step. We say, hmm, uh, my, my nodes are, I don't care about them, we can throw them away. Now we go to the point where we say, Kubernetes clusters, I don't care about Kubernetes clusters, Kubernetes clusters are also cattle, I can throw them away and quickly create them anew. And why not do the same approach with a data center? So we created basically a template for a data center for each of the locations where you run it to. So we have one management layer on top of it, which is currently located in, uh, in Azure, but this doesn't, this doesn't matter. And we are using our own software, which is an open source software called Kubematic, like our company. <laughs> so we basically say uh, we run Kubernetes inside of Kubernetes, so we have on our master, we have, or on a seat, so we have a seat in each of the locations, and you run there uh, your cluster with the control plane, and inside of the, uh, inside of the worker nodes of your seat or of your master, you have the control planes of the user clusters inside of containers. So this makes the overhead really, really small because uh, HA user cluster only needs 0 0.3 CPUs to running an HCA setup and uh, you only, the, the worker nodes are really then there for, for your workload. And you can quickly spin those clusters up in each of the environments that you uh, potentially create because you don't want to run only production. You also want to have a dev and an in integration and probably a sandbox where you want to test things. But the problem is when you template a data center you don't need just Kubernetes clusters. There are a lot of more things that you need in every state single data center. And this brought us to the idea, hey, why not create a service cluster uh, right next to our seed that is in every single data center. And with this service cluster, we provide all of the basic services that you need to run the data center. So we started, and this is now bringing us to all of the CNCF world, we started to create this, uh, the service clusters. So in every of the service clusters, we have a, D, uh, a core DNS for DNS service, a registry, we're currently using Harbor, uh, a CI-CD pipeline, Argos CD. Um, and now the funny thing, some, uh, you need IPs for your worker nodes and for your load balancers, so. And for tablets and printers. <laughs> yes, and tablets and printers and you, and, uh, there is nothing. I mean, there is something. We, we figured out, hmm, I see DHCP, but I see DHCP does not run in, in a container, so we 
created ISC DHCP inside of a container and now can basically give IP addresses everywhere uh, outside of our Kubernetes cluster while running the DHCP server inside of a Kubernetes cluster. And you need storage to, to store like pictures. Uh, every single manufacturing process is uh, taking a photo so that you basically see is everything all right, can we improve on this? So there's a lot of pictures being taken. And also you need a repository. Uh, but wait a minute, they are, not all, all, uh, they are not all errors connected to the master service cluster. Yeah, for the S3 we said, okay, we don't, want, we don't want to have the data replicated to the master because it's just too much data and it's not important. The, the data is on, uh, only important inside of, the, uh, inside of the data center where it's really, really needed. And uh, this brings us to the point that, yeah, you can template it, but you cannot do it for every service in the same way. So you need to really figure out what is important for your use case and what is not important for your use case. And as you can see, um, we set up the idea that everything has its a local address, which means that every single service in all of the data, uh, data centers has always the same address. So when I'm in, data, when I'm in a manufacturing plant A uh, and I call local.dns.manufacturing, I, uh, I get the nearest core DNS. If I do the same thing uh, in uh, data center B, it's the same address, but it's also the local one. And this brings us to our flexibility that we have uh, when we hit a disaster case, because as we said, half an hour outage, one million loss. So basically the data center, uh, if, if something happens with the internet connection, we still need to our plan to be operational. So we made our failover case the default. So our failover case is always, this is how it, the, the, the request is typically looks. So we always call the, the local service and we don't care if we have the master available or we don't care if the other data centers are available. This also is a speed improvement. But what if my local installation is failing? That's also easy. We can just fail over to the master or fail over to the, to the second uh, data center location. And uh, how we manage to do this is basically everything is to, uh, tripled down from the master. So the changes are made and pushed to the master and it's always uh, put down to all of the, the services below so that you basically can repeat uh, that, that all of the data is still uh, in, on, the same, on the same page. And this makes everything really, really easy in a disaster case and we can even say, oh, we have lost our master and we have lost our local data center, so we just use another data center. And this makes everything more and more reliant to uh, any other topic. So what, this was the theory, what we started with and what went, went wrong now. Yeah, basically you can think that it's not everything worked from scratch. So, and it was more like a trail map. So it's really something what you consider each project has its own characteristics. Each data center has its own characteristics. And there are people who also are involving there. So you cannot just say, hey, we do it that way and it's the only way we do. Because security says, I don't care what you want, you need to um, discuss this with us and we need to approve. So we are here, the final one who approves it. So that's, um, yeah, and that's brought brought up to the idea, so it's mostly like a trail map what you repeat and repeat and try to improve. So our core success was we started small. So we said, okay, we want one time the first end-to-end -end thing solved and then we improving by time. And the first thing what we take a look was the local infra setup. So we needed to get into the data center setup. We needed to get it explained it to us. We need to understand what are the poli policies, uh, how we can connect to this. Um, even like to have a jump server there was really a hard uh, task because first you need to convince them, okay, we have the safe uh, uh, implementation for it and we, our, we call it virtual operation center, um, is really safe and it's safe that we can access your critical production network. Also backup, 
Um, what means backup? I mean, yeah, we do automatic backup every 20 minutes from our clusters. No problem. But that's not the end of the story because you need to think about where to store it in the disaster case because it doesn't help you if you have it in your local data center and it's burned down. So there you need to talk with the customer, okay, what are your failover strategy? Where we can store it? Do we have a S3 service to store it and so on? And um, yeah, then core infrastructure. Basically, we thought that's the easy part. But um, we figured out that, yeah, vSphere kind of is different as we expected it, as we saw it at other customers. Somehow we have now vSAN, we had dedicated zones where we wasn't aware about, and we need to figure out, okay, how we can use this to make it really reliable. And network, I mean, yeah, you know, when if you have a name for something like Wonderwall, <laughs> the network was really um, a challenge because sometimes we didn't, didn't even know there's a firewall in between. Security, firewall, I said it, um, segmentation and authentication. Authentication is important. We need to have every person identified. Then, how you onboard a managed, whole managed service team with customer accounts. This was really, really an organizational challenge. Good, what else? So, services. Um, we said everything we want to consume needs to be a service. Mario told you there's three service, for, for example, and this must be local. The DNS service be local caches. Um, it was this implementation detail that you can reconcile was key. So they are independent, but they can reconcile. And that is the point here on the independence thing. So we said central master, this is the holy gray. If we change our configuration, that's there. And on the locals, we just have replicas, similar F as pods. They can go away, they can spin up, they can scale up. But if something happens, the core brain is the central master. And then we have this partial connectivity where we said, okay, that must be our default and we need to reconcile. And that's brought us to this architecture. I think automation is for everyone clear, but if you have things what is not automated and maybe you have new tools what you don't know, um, then you think about declarative uh, management tools. So you, you, we created wrapper around things uh, what maybe are not in our responsibility, but we needed to configure them and need, we needed to, to bring that to other departments, like the firewall rules. Cluster management, that's mostly our core topic, where we came from, but this was only one pass, and that's what we find out. So one pass is there, we have a global service per API to, to provision across the cloud. That means I can talk to the same endpoint to provision a cluster in Azure or on the local data center in Europe or in the local data center in the US. And that's helped us that uh, we have the ops tooling, we have dashboards, and also there we need to be aware, okay, how can we come operational when a data center is disconnected. So this was also a use case to think about, okay, we need potential more entry points to the custom environment because if we only have one jump host, and this one is not reachable, then we have a single point of failure. Okay, we solved this one. And then we came to like the applications. Okay, we find that the application has some other dependencies as we saw, so using Kafka, they had some really classical workload as well, and they have super nice microservices. And then we like they consumed a lot of storage, and we, we run everything fine in vSphere, and then we moved to cloud, and looked also fine, but after a time we're getting, okay, we only have 10% utilization in the community's cluster, why? We had a cluster autoscaler, as well as on-premise, we have cluster autoscaling, but the on-premise VMs can mount a lot of more volumes as the machine type, what we choose in Azure. So I don't know if everyone knows that, but in Azure you have a limitation of disks, what you can mount to the machine. And that brought us, we spent a lot of money to, for nothing because uh, the CPU memory was idle. So we redesigned it, learned it, and said, okay, we need different groups of uh, node pools. And then the autoscaler was also like modified that it can scale individually based on the volume workload and based on normal workload. And yeah that's scaled then up. And then we said, okay, now we understand it. We said, um, okay, let's continuous watch. And that's the key point, that you start the whole thing again. You cannot implement this in one step. If you want to do it, 
it will be slow, you never have a result, and the people will get asking, hey, is there something? It's like a black box. And for us, what a key success factor, hey, we have quickly something we can show, and now we improve. And we now improve the security, but the application team could already start, and the other teams can already work with it. Yeah, and we came about with three key points. So the platform that we have need to be uh, adapt uh, by design. Uh, we need some kind of standardization, and we also need modularity because not every, as we learned, not every data center is the same. And we must be flexible, but we need to do it with predefined components that we can easily really re reuse. And currently, we have a managed service uh, with under, and under the SLA. We have 39 clusters, 206 nodes, 878 uh, CPUs. 3.2 terabyte of memory and 200 terabyte of storage. And also you need a playground, which is not under SLA, that you can just screw up, like delete the master of, uh, and some things like this. You so, this? Yes, I did. Um, cluster, so we have 12 clusters, uh, 90, 94, uh, 49 <laughs> nodes, 274 CPU and 1.1 uh, terabyte of memory. And with this, we are finished, and you as well. So KubeCon is over. <laughs> uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Questions? If not, oh, there's one. Uh, can you, can you, there's a mic. Next, next to you. How much time did you take? Oh, uh, so uh, we set it up. We started implementing it in February uh, last year, and we went production in April. It was true. Yeah, and we April we, was pre-production. Yeah, April was pre, uh, and we basically we did it with two engineers from our side. Any other question? If not. Have a great evening. Thanks for coming. Thanks for staying. And yeah, see you at next KubeCon, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs>